I'm Kevin Cameron, and my topic at this moment is plain journal bearings, which are at the heart of all modern engines, nearly all. We've discussed uh, another time the fact that the original motorcycle crankshaft was a multiple piece unit, and that the connecting rod was also made in one piece, so that you had to assemble the crank pin into one flywheel, put the bearing on the crank pin, put the connecting rod onto the bearing, then put the other flywheel together and so forth, build it all up into a unit. With so many joints, when RPM began to rise beyond a reasonable level, such crankshafts shifted out of alignment as a result of vibration. There came to be a desire for a more rigid construction well, a one-piece forged crankshaft obviously has to have split bearings, bearings made in halves, in order for the bearings to be assembled over the crank. And the nature of those bearings is determined by the fact that when people tried to have rotating parts supported by a film of oil rather than by balls or rollers, they had to deal with the problem of oil contamination by wear particles or by dirt. Engines uh, for years were sand cast with a rough surface finish. You guessed it, there might be sand in that finish. So what happens if a piece of grit gets between a crankshaft journal, which is highly polished and truly cylindrical, and the bearing? Well. If there's no place for that piece of grit to go, it cuts the daylights out of both of them and may cause the bearing to seize. So it was learned very early on that the bearing had to be made out of material that was softer than the journal on the crankshaft or other rotating part. And in the early days, what was done was that bearings were poured. They actually poured liquid Babbitt metal into the bearing in a, th in a thin layer and then finished it after it was cast in place to make a cylindrical seat for the journal of the crankshaft. But because that was a very slow way to build things and incurred a lot of costs, the idea of having the soft bearing metal on a steel backing ready to simply drop into place had a certain appeal process was developed by an outfit in Indianapolis, which has always been a fairly substantial manufacturing town. It used to be the capital of the auto industry until it went to Detroit. Their uh, manufacture of this type of bearing was licensed by an outfit in England that manufactured these bearings for uh, aircraft engines begins with the steel backing. On the steel backing is plated or otherwise deposited a thin layer of quite soft material and then a layer of uh, even softer, it used to be lead, today it's probably tin, is deposited on top of that and there might be a layer of indium to prevent corrosion from attacking the bearing. Now if a piece of grit gets between the hard journal on the crankshaft and, the, and the, the bearing that supports it, it is simply pounded into the soft material and ceases to do harm. These bearings need a steady supply of oil in order to function what is called an oil wedge has to be formed. Imagine the journal fitting into this bearing and its other half, which I don't have here because it weighs 300 pounds, and oil being present in a clearance of, say, a thousandth or so. Now the engine starts up and firing impulses are imposed on the connecting rods, pushing the journal slightly off center. Now, if you imagine the space between the journal and the bearing shell, it is a very, very thin wedge. What happens is that viscosity, the internal resistance of the oil,
causes it to be swept into the open end of that wedge and dragged toward the loaded zone, which is where the journal is, most, is closest to the bearing surface. And in an engine that's working quite hard, that distance of closest approach between the journal and the bearing surface is measured in microns, which are millionths of a meter. Oil has to be delivered into the bearing to make up for oil that is leaking out at the edges continuously as a result of the applied load. The oil pressure from the oil pump does not support the load. Oil is delivered into the large part of the bearing clearance where it can enter the bearing clearance easily and is then swept around by the rotation of the crankshaft or the crank pin into the loaded zone. It is viscosity that enables the oil to be swept into the loaded zone and it has been found in dragster engines that the pressure in the loaded zone can be as high as 12,000 pounds per square inch. Now, since you're probably aware that oil pumps typically produce 40 to 60 pounds per square inch, it's clear that oil pump pressure cannot support the load. What is supporting the load is the combination of oil viscosity, its resistance to sliding over itself, and the rotation of the journal, which drags oil by its own viscosity into the loaded zone. Oil is being lost out the sides all the while, but it's being added in the large clearance part of the bearing and the rotation of the journal is sweeping it continuously into the loaded zone so that a stable condition is reached in which the bearing is floating on a film of oil. Because the clearance in a bearing is extremely small and the oil film is present, such a bearing has great damping properties because motions of the journal, in order to move at all, it has to squeeze oil through a very narrow space, namely the bearing clearance. So plane bearings have wonderful damping. Plane bearings are now a mature technology that does a very good job. When an engine is finally worn out and goes to the scrapyard, it is generally not crankshaft bearings that are the cause of its demise, but something mechanical in another part. Plane bearings do the job. They're very durable. As long as they get oil that is clean and of an appropriate temperature, like the bearing supporting that water turbine, they last and last because oil is constantly keeping the two parts separate.